Hiroshima, Japan, and today I am talking with Chris Blakerby in Tokyo, Japan. Thanks hey. for joining, Chris. Hey, JJ. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's so great to have you on. I think if we're talking about future tech and sustainability, we have to talk about what we're doing with all the space junk. So this is fantastic to have you on and share your insights from this new industry, which of course is becoming more and more important. Yeah, it is. And it's and it's not something that I think most uh, environmentally minded um folks, uh, people thinking about sustainability, don't usually click on, oh, satellites, of course. Uh, that doesn't always uh, come to mind. But you're right, it's gaining a lot more attention uh, in the, within, the, within the space community, uh, even in the public, the public sphere. So it's something that we've talked about a lot in the space community for decades, really. But action on it, actually taking steps to, to solve it, has been um, has been minimal, uh, and so we're really excited to to be a company that's leading the, the 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 drive toward both publicizing it and taking action to to do something about the growing issue of uh, of debris in orbit. Now, your company, which I just put on screen right now, is called Astroscale, and it, it sounds like your founder Nobu Okada-san he had a vision that this was going to be very, very important. And he had an idea, we need to be up in space, we need to be dealing with our trash. And I, it reminded me when I was listening to his uh, mission or his philosophy of why he started, um, it reminded me of, you know, when the Japanese went to the World Cup and they had a fa fantastic reputation for cleaning up their area before they left. And I thought of all the countries to start this initiative to clean up space junk, it seems perfect that it comes from Japan. It does. And uh, Nobu did have a, a vision eight years ago now when he founded the company. Um, and it was this, uh, this idea that I was just saying where there's a big issue there and no one's doing anything about it. And he had a background in uh, as an IT entrepreneur. So he had a background in kind of smaller business and startups and things. And he was thinking, what if I took this startup mentality and shifted it to, to space and to this issue of debris cleanup? Um, he was, uh, there was roundly, um, I wouldn't say ridiculed, but there was a lot of questions about whether it would be possible. Uh, the technology is too tough. How are we gonna solve the technical problems? Uh, there's, there's no policy on this. Who's going to pay for it? What's the business case? We still hear those questions today, but uh, Nobu certainly heard a lot of those when he founded this as a single person uh, eight years ago. Here we are. Now we have 200 people about in the company. Um, we've, we've raised $190 million. Uh, we have a satellite in orbit where we're testing out our capability. So we're making these, these steps um, from the vision that he had. To the second part of your comment question about Japan being an appropriate place to focus on something like this, you're completely right. I mean, this idea of responsibility, uh, cleanliness, uh, cleaning up after yourself, you know, we're all taught that as, as kids. But uh, in Japan, it's, it's maybe it's, uh, it's internalized a lot more and it's, uh, it's a really important issue. And I, and I think there is something to be said for the fact that, that a, a company like this uh, driving global opinion and direction on this issue is Japan-based. Uh, and I think Japan should take pride in that. The fact that uh, this is something where Japan is concerned about environmentalism, uh, both on the ground and in orbit. Uh, and so it's, it's a great connection to, um, to, to connecting everything that we, we need on the planet to make ourselves sustainable. Oh, I'm not hearing you, Joy. Are you on mute? Thank you. <laughs> came, back, came back. Yeah, for every uh, space movie that I watch, whenever they send up the rockets and then they drop parts as they're going up, and I'm thinking, what happens to that? Where where is that going? You know, and then uh, your your director in the UK because this is a collaboration between Japan, US, and UK, I believe. And your director, John Auburn, was saying, 
it's like if your car breaks on the highway, you don't just leave it there, you know? <laughs> And I thought, exactly, like this, why are we, we're sending up all this stuff and just leaving it there? It just seems crazy. So yeah. finally, a company like Astroscale is thinking about how to deal with that, right? No, you're exactly right. And and so a couple of points on this. First, we're, um, as far as our international footprint, uh, we were started in Singapore um, and uh, that's where Nobu founded the company. He was living there in Singapore. Um, he then opened up an R&D office in Tokyo a couple of years later in 2015. The UK office was opened in 2017. We then opened a US office in 2019 in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we also have an office in, uh, in Washington, D.C. with some people. And then we actually purchased the assets of a company in Israel. So we actually are now in five countries, Singapore, Japan, UK, US, and Israel. Uh, so from one person uh, in, yeah, there's the map right there that, that, that shows our um, global presence. Uh, from one person in one country in Singapore to a global presence in five different countries uh, around, around the world, um, we've, we've spread out. So um, it's, uh, it is a truly international company, and um, the problem is truly an international problem. So it's not an issue that we can solve uh, just in Japan or just in the U.S. or just in the U.K. It's something that takes uh, political cooperation globally and technical cooperation globally. So we knew from the start that we had to be a global company. Um, that comes with complications. Every country has their own regulations and whether it's uh, human resource regulations or other types of um, policy regulations that we have to navigate, but it is essential that we do so. As to what John said, uh, and it's something we talk about a lot. Yeah, we see ourselves as the, uh, so for any American listeners, the triple A for Japan listeners, the JAF of space. We're going to get up there, and when there's a uh, there's a problem, or there's an accident, or a satellite fails, or a launch vehicle goes up and leaves some of its upper stage. When a, when a rocket launches, the the lower parts of it will fall back down into the earth or burn up in the atmosphere. But the top parts, the upper stage parts, they'll stay up there, and so. When those things stay up there or when a satellite is launched and it, if it fails in orbit, yeah, right now it just stays there. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't come down. And depending on how high it is, uh, the altitude from the Earth, it could stay there for, you know, if it's really low, it could be only up there for a few months. And then it comes back down in the atmosphere and burns up. As you get up higher and higher in altitude, it gets up there to stay for 10, 20, 30, hundreds of years. And so... The, uh, the analogy of saying it's like driving a car and if it, if it stalls on the side of the road, okay, just leave it there. Yeah, that's kind of like what we're doing in space. But even worse, it's like if the car is moving and spinning and we leave it on the road and we don't take care of it because that's what the satellites are doing up there. Now, it's not a perfect analogy because, of course, uh, this orbital environment, there's a lot more space. So it's not like you're on a two-lane highway where a car is going to certainly hit something. But as we launch more and more into the same orbits, those orbits get crowded uh, and space is big, but the orbits that we utilize for these important missions, it's comparatively small. So um, we have to be really careful as we, as we grow. Yeah. It's amazing more accidents don't happen as well, because right. it's not just garbage that's not nice to see. I think one of one of your team in the UK was saying space sustainability is essential to any future space exploration and the tiniest debris can cause huge problems and even the space station has to change its course sometimes to avoid junk space junk or debris of some kind so and I think you sent me a graph showing how it's just getting worse and worse as we head towards 2030, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, you're referencing Alex there, one of our great engineers in the UK, and she is uh, she made the right point. I mean, this if we're going to keep utilizing space, uh, we need to make sure it's sustainable. It's it is it is it is interconnected 
um, completely. And it's the same here. If we're going to keep utilizing the environment here on Earth, we better make sure that it's sustainable. And uh, we, we really see our orbital environment as another natural resource. And just like there's natural resources of forests and rivers and oceans and air here on Earth, that orbital environment is another natural resource that if we don't protect it, it's really at our own peril. And so we need to make sure that um, that we continue to do so. So Alex's comment uh, was was exactly right. And then the graphic you're showing there, it's uh, it's it's unscientific, as you can see. It just shows uh, the, our representation of this. But that's where things should, are heading. I mean, the number of satellites that are are in orbit now, uh, a little over three thousand or so. It's already, those are the number of active satellites, it's already about double what it was even five to 10 years ago. I mean, we see some of these big companies like uh, SpaceX or there's another company called OneWeb that are launching hundreds of satellites, thousands. And so it's, it's increasing the, uh, the population in orbit and just by obvious definition, that increases the risk of some kind of collision. Uh, and so there's these... Uh, 3,000 or so active satellites, and that is in addition to the tens of thousands of pieces of debris that are about the size of a baseball, about 10 centimeters across, tens of thousands, millions of pieces that are at the centimeter uh, uh, diameter. So all of these new satellites that are being launched, you know, there's there's risks to those. Uh, and then on the other, the right side of that, of that uh, slide, says shows that there's going to be humans in space too. Right now there's, you know, between three to eight or so people at a time on the International Space Station, but there's a lot of companies who are talking about privatized uh, human space travel in the next, well, in the next couple of years uh, even, uh, but then going forward a lot more. So we're not talking about just protecting assets, which provide us the data every day, that is those satellites, we're talking about human lives in orbit. So. Um, there's a true impact on uh, on what we're going to do if we if, if we let it be like it is. Yeah, so important to at least be discussing yeah. how it's going to work. Um, it reminded me of the talk I had with Elizabeth Tasker, uh, working for JAXA in communications, and about her book Planet Factory. Um, it was such a great discussion, which makes you realize we need to take care of the Earth we are on. And this this idea of escaping to another planet because we've messed up this one. Well, I think that is now extending to what I think you call lower space, right? Orbiting around the Earth, that we're actually messing up our orbit area to be unscientific um, as well. And we need to really think about this because our planet is very special and we need to take care of it. That includes our nearby space, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, low Earth orbit, as one of the users just printed there, LEO, LEO, low Earth orbit is what you're referring to. Um, yeah, we, we better. And there's a, there's a lot of talk right now about uh, being a multiplanetary species. Uh, you know, if we want humanity to survive as a, as a species, we have to be multiplanetary. So um, we... Uh, there is a there's a large contingent. There's a big group. Elon Musk is the most vocal about this. Uh, it's not it's not a secret that he's the one talking a lot about going to Mars and setting up settlements on Mars and being a multiplanetary species. In case uh, we um, we uh, we have a you know something happens here on Earth. But I think you're exactly right, JJ. I mean we we have to we have to focus on protecting where we are. We know without a doubt that the best planet to live on is earth <laughs> okay there's no there's no question so we can talk about being a multiplanetary species but i think all of us like 100 percent, would still choose that earth is is a more convenient better place to live now that's not saying that people don't want to go to mars i think it would be incredible to go there but to actually set up a society uh, and the community on Mars is going to take a lot of work. Uh, so um, we need to protect where we are. Yeah. Uh, and so I, but I think we can do both. It, it, it's, it, we don't have to be, you know, we can, we can do, we can do two things. And we, the, the, the space community writ large, 
can do two things. There can certainly be a focus on exploration uh, and, and looking to, to go to other planets and, and see if we can start sustaining life elsewhere in the solar system. Uh, but that doesn't mean we ignore the necessary, necessary protection of, of Earth, both uh, you know, terrestrial environmental issues and orbital environmental. And it seems like the more we explore space and learn about space and learn about other planets, the more we appreciate how special Earth is and um, how our combination of so many different uh, atmosphere versus uh, where we are positioned in the solar system, all these amazing things by chance, which make it possible for us to be alive. Um, it's just phenomenal. So that was that was a great talk with Elizabeth Tasker. Let's talk more specifically about exactly what you guys are doing with Astroscale to help this problem. So um, at Astroscale, we're looking at a couple of different uh, uh, lines of business, basically, all of which are focused on um, all of which are focused on sustainability. And the the basic point is. Uh, low Earth orbit, which is the slide you're showing here, low Earth orbit, which is the uh, altitudes that are closer to Earth between about 200 to kilometers to 2000 kilometers altitude is one main used orbit. And the other one is, is geo, the geosynchronous orbit. That's about 30,000 kilometers. Now, those are two of the main orbits that we use right now um, uh, to get data that includes communications data, includes Earth observation uh, pictures. Um, it, it, it includes anything. We, we use it for so much. We use it for talking to relatives, we use it for bank transfers. We use it to understand the weather. Uh, and those are the orbits that are getting really crowded. So we want to focus on removing debris that is currently in orbit to make sure it's not a risk anymore and preparing satellites, all of those satellites that we just talked about that are going to be launching, preparing them before they launch so that they can be more easily removed uh, in the future. And when the company started, and a lot of our focus on those two issues has been in the low Earth orbit side. Uh, and that's the side where the International Space Station is there. And that's where we see the, the highest increase in a lot of these smaller satellites that are being launched. All of the SpaceX satellites, for example, they're all in low Earth orbit. All of these other uh, new companies that are developing these communications uh, networks are launching to low Earth orbit. Uh, and there, the uh, objects in that orbit are moving really fast, uh, 28,000 kilometers an hour, quick. If you've seen the movie Gravity, um, it's not scientifically accurate, <laughs> but it does give a decent view about, about what, what the problem is, that there's a lot of debris and that an accident could happen and that, that there are objects that move around quickly around the earth uh, and could create more of a problem. So what we wanna do is limit that risk. We're never gonna make it completely clean. It's just not gonna happen. But what we need to do is limit the risk as much as possible. And that leads to going up and grabbing uh, large pieces of debris and bringing them out of the way, bringing them down into the atmosphere so they burn up in the atmosphere, number one. And number two, whenever one of those satellites launches that we show that big sharp increase in satellites over the next 10 years, Put something on there that makes it easier to dock to them. And, and our proposal is a, a plate that has a ferromagnetic material so a magnet can attach to it and then be able to, to bring it down. That makes it easier for us to service it because we know what we're building toward. And a big aspect of what we need to do is make things less expensive. We need to make it cheaper to be able to service these satellites. That's the only way that a market's going to grow. And that's the only way that we're going to encourage sustainability. So those are our two main focus areas um, for trying to reduce the debris. Now, I talked about our company in Israel that we have now. That company, along with the U.S., is also focused on fixing satellites, repairing satellites. And there the focus is a little bit more in that higher orbit, the geo orbit, where they have really big satellites. And we are building a capability to go up there and fix those satellites. So those are the three main um, focus areas that we're looking at. Yeah, really exciting. Um, so fixing, repairing, and uh, bringing it back, 
bringing back the garbage. Those are the main areas, it seems. Now, you've been developing the models and testing the models for many years. There was a launch in 2017, which didn't work. But more recently, you've had a successful launch. Um, tell us about Elsa D. Yeah. So first, you referenced our first launch, which was back a few years ago, and on that one, it was the it was the launch vehicle, unfortunately, that failed. So we had a small satellite that was going to be measuring debris in orbit, and that's that launch vehicle failed. So the satellite, unfortunately, we lost it. Um, that didn't stop us, of course. We kept on moving, and uh, about two months ago, we launched Elsa D. And Elsa D is in orbit now. Uh, successful launch. You have the picture there of the launch uh, up on the screen. It was a great day. We were all very nervous, as you can guess. Uh, but uh, the launch went great. And then, you know, the launch is a really exciting part. And it's like the very um, emotional part to watch that. And everybody focuses on the launch. But inside the company, we were more focused on, all right, making sure we can get connectivity to the satellite. So a couple hours after it launches, we want to make sure that all of our ground stations, we have a bunch of different communications uh, ground stations that we've partnered with around the world that is talking to it. And we need to be able to talk to the satellite. And so, all right, it's in orbit now. Did the solar panels, which is, you know, the kind of wings that help with power, did they get deployed properly? Are we able to talk to it? And you're showing Chris Walker, one of our lead operations engineers there in the top right. He's the guy who was sitting in the operations room, which was in, which is in the UK and basically commanding, directing the team to say, okay, where is it? What do we have? What's the next step? And we have this big checklist of making sure that everything is nominal or everything is going as we expected. And it all did. So it was a, lo a long night, a late night, but a successful night. And it's still, uh, it's in orbit now and it's operating well. Um, and what we're going to be doing with LCD is we're going to be testing out the technical capabilities to grab a piece of debris in orbit. And what we did is we launched two, two satellites together um, and they were, they were connected. I have a little, I don't know if you can see my little doll here. Yeah. Yeah. So this is our cool little LCD doll. And so we launched two satellites together uh, and one is the small piece. And this is like our piece of dummy debris. So this is our stand in for a debris. And on this piece of debris, debris, we have a, uh, a plate. Like I mentioned that we want to prepare satellites with a docking plate. We have this plate right here on the piece of debris, and it's got a ferromagnetic material, so it can be attached to with a magnet. This is Elsa. This is our servicer. And so on Elsa, looks cute, right, with the little eyes on there. They don't really have eyes, but they kind of do because they have cameras that obviously can but visualize. Because, because this is Japan, you have to make it look cute. You've got to make it kind yeah. of cute. Like, right? You probably have a mascot for this yeah. somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's this is it. This is this is this is her. This is Elsa. So um, Elsa's got a little uh, on on her mouth, so to speak. There's a there's a uh, a magnetic ar an arm that reaches out that has magnets on the edge of the arm, end of the arm. So these these launch together, connected. Uh, these solar panels were folded down when the launch happened, and so when it got up into the orbit that we want, these solar panels extended, extended out. Um, and that's where that's that's how it is right now. So right now, LCD is orbiting the Earth, looking like this. This uh, space this scale is asking, who did you launch with? And I uh, noticed uh, your project manager, uh, Seita Izuka-san, was in Kazakhstan. Is that right for the launch? So, yeah, we launched on a Soyuz, which is a Russian rocket, and they launch out of Kazakhstan. And uh, Seita uh, is the project manager, and he was there with a team of seven others who were there for about a month, longer, a longer than a month, seven weeks or so in Kazakhstan. Uh, so they did incredible work being there uh, in Kazakhstan. Obviously, during, a, during this situation, during the pandemic, they went there and, and stayed in Kazakhstan, uh, got the satellite integrated onto the rocket, uh, and then uh, they actually came back just before launch so they could be in the control room to be uh, be prepared for it when when the launch happened. So yeah, we launched out of Kazakhstan, uh, and again, it was a beautiful launch. It went great. Um, and so now Elsa is up there in orbit, and what it's going to do? We're now going through some some final um, preparations. So in the next couple months, what we're going to do is start some demonstrations where we're going to separate out the debris from our servicing satellite and move in and capture it. And we're going to do a couple of different 
uh, iterations of this. We're going to do one where we where we spin the debris, so simulate a piece of out of control debris and move Elsa around, look for that plate, and when it finds the plate, move in and capture it. And we're going to test various aspects of this in orbit um, over the next uh, several months. Um, and then uh, when it's all done, we're going to bring it back down into orbit and and burn it up in the atmosphere. So this is strictly a technology demonstration. We're not removing any debris from this. Our main goal is to show that we have the capability uh, to do it and then start talking. And we are already talking, but continue discussions with uh, commercial and government partners and customers to, to make sure we do for future missions. That's awesome. Uh, Frass says, thanks for making your live at a time I can watch. This is amazing information. Thank you so much, Frass. Mm -hmm. I think we should do more lunchtime talks. This is probably a good time for working people to join us over their lunch break. Thanks yeah. for joining everybody. Yeah, that's great. And uh, Space Gal says she probably watched it launch. Wow, was it live, like online somewhere? Yep. You could watch it launch. It was um, mid-afternoon, three, four o'clock or so on uh, March 22nd. So it was, um, yeah, very uh, convenient time to watch online. And it sounds like that's what Space Gal did, watched it online. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so you sent me information about ADR, active debris removal. So that's what you were just talking about, right? So okay. sort of. It's it's connected, JJ. It's um it's got a lot of the same uh, uh, technical background, a lot of the same software that's going to be in there. The big difference is we're calling this what Elsa's doing end of life EOL. So Elsa stands for End of Life Services by Astroscale. Okay. Elsa. It doesn't have a Disney Frozen connection. So we would have liked to have that kind of cooperation, <laughs> but um, so it is, it is separate from that. So this is end of life services by Astroscale EOL. So you, you put that one on the bottom, uh, bottom right of everybody's screen. Um, a lot of the capabilities to achieve both of those missions are shared. There's a lot of crossover. The big difference is the capture capability is the connection capability. So I mentioned that with Elsa and with all EOL, that's where we focus on satellites that have been prepared to be, to be connected to, to be docked with before they launch. That's EOL. ADR are those that are currently up there. And they are not ferromagnetic. They do not have uh, necessarily an easy capture capability that we can directly um, build to uh, on volume, build a lot of satellites with the same one. It has to be more uh, bespoke more um, specific technology. So for ADR, we're having to build uh, a separate type of capture capability, whether it's a robotic arm, uh, or in this case, it, it's, a, it's a kind of extension that goes into this little, um, this little payload adapter area, and it reaches out and cleps on to, to each side of that area, and then, that, and then we direct it down again into the atmosphere to burn up. And so for ADR, the basic difference to think about is the capture capability is different. And for ADR, we're talking about existing debris. And for EOL, we're talking about future surfacing. Uh, and so for the ADR side, we actually have a mission that is a precursor to an ADR mission uh, with JAXA right now that we're building out that's going to go up to a JAXA upper stage rocket and basically take a look at it, circle it get really close, see how it's spinning, move in really close to that payload adapter ring that you see there and just take pictures to really understand it. That's the first step toward, um, toward bringing it down. And that's kind of like the last missionary, which you've since put up there, this ISSA, in situ space situational awareness, understanding the environment a bit better. And so that's the first mission that we're building with Jackson now. Jackson intends to have a second mission uh, that they haven't announced yet. So we haven't been selected, but uh, they have announced their intention to do this mission, which would then go up and bring down that upper stage rocket body. Uh, so there's the, uh, the, the difference between those two business lines, but there's still a lot of overlap. Wow, so interesting. Um, JAXA is amazing space agency. Thanks, Space Girl. And she says more atograms to learn. Yeah, there's lots of uh, jargon, there's I imagine, in your job, right? There's a lot. There's a lot in the space industry generally. We've got to be careful about just throwing around these acronyms. And I was in the government before, and it's the same thing. You know, you can say a whole sentence without saying a real word. 
just one like acronym after another. <laughs> Now, something that's really interesting, which I think you have a very interesting insight into, is you were working with the Japan or the American Embassy in Japan. You were working with NASA. You've been working with other agencies around Asia and now the UK and the US. Um, Russia, is it really as international collaboration as it looks? Is everybody helping each other or is it very competitive like who's going to get up there first and and do it first so it's such a great question and it's something we think about all the time um both between countries and between companies uh, to to first talk about the company side which you didn't really ask but i'll, I'll touch on that because the good word that we always use is um we're competitors. uh so we're there's competitors but the industry is too nascent to just go it all alone right now. We have to look for partnerships. We have to look for ways to work together because if we try to go it alone, the ecosystem's not gonna grow. It's just not gonna work out. So um, that's something we think about now as uh, in the small industry, as, as or the small ecosystem as the industries are growing. Um, space, the space age famously, as everybody knows, started with a space race. Uh, and, and the reason that the U.S. Uh, uh, went to the moon is because they were being driven by Russia. And uh, there was the back and forth throughout the 60s uh, or late 50s and 60s with, um, you know, Sputnik and Gagarin and John Glenn and Alan Shepard and, you know, Neil Armstrong. And so it was back and forth. It was a competition. And um, we were almost literally racing to the moon. And that's not the language that we all want to use anymore. That's not the language we, we like to use. We, we talk about going back and doing these things uh, cooperatively, going back uh, to stay, going back not just to plant a flag and leave a footprint and then, okay, all set, we're done there. Uh, that's, that's kind of the mindset of, um, of the, the Apollo era, especially in retrospect, uh, was uh, that's, what it, that's what it looked like. And so when, when we made it to the moon, and we had uh, done those six missions to the moon. And after the last Apollo mission, uh, basically just uh, just stepped away. That's changing. Um, there is a lot of cooperation. And so much of my job when I was with NASA was focused on building those ties uh, with Japan and the US, primarily when I was out here uh, at, the, uh, at the embassy, um, and also uh, globally. Like I did a lot of stuff internationally. And so, we, there's a recognition now that we're not going to be able to make these next giant leaps to steal Neil's words uh, without working together. And what we did with ELSA, I think, was a very uh, good example of, of the international nature of the business. We built the satellite, the space segment here in Japan. We, uh, we launched it from Kazakhstan, as we said. We uh, controlled it. Our operations center is in the UK. We got our license. We have, have to get various licenses before you launch something. So we got one of our licenses uh, for what's called Spectrum. We got that from Japan. We got a license to do the launch from the UK. Uh, then we had ground. Uh, we had uh, basically communications, uh, the ground control um, system. We had dishes around the world that we contracted with that I mentioned, and that's in all different countries. So we need to work with companies and countries around the world. So it was a truly international mission. And that's how uh, I think a lot of it's going to be going forward. So interesting. Uh, Anthony Davis has joined and asked, doesn't ham radio have a lot of impact on space exploration? So that's a question, Anthony. I'm not sure of the details. I mean, there's a lot of ham radio operators that um, certainly are active. I mean, even on the, just the private the, the sector, you know, individuals um, that, are, that are active in trying to, 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 uh, to connect and to talk and to, and to do stuff focused on space exploration. So in that sense, yes. Um, and I think a lot of people who eventually get into space start out by, by doing that. And then that really spurs on uh, excitement when you can actually communicate, you know, through ham radio uh, an interest in doing more. So in that sense, I think it, it really does. In terms of a larger sense, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to be happy to talk about it more, but I don't really know 
too much else on the detail of that. Uh, Space Gal has a great question. How long is your mission? So the nominal time frame for the mission is about six months or so. So we launched in uh, in end of March. So we have uh, three demonstrations that we're basically planning. And so we're expecting to get them done by the end of this calendar year. So six months are a little bit longer. And then after that, we'll we'll reduce the orbit of the um, of the of the satellite uh, as much as we can with the fuel we have. We'll bring it down and then the atmosphere will and then the, the, the Earth's gravity will do the rest in terms of just pulling it in. I just want to make a note here that the founder of Astroscale in 2013, he promised to have something up by 2021, was it? Or 2020? I mean, he's done it. He's been on target. It must have been so many hurdles along the way, but what an amazing feat. Yeah. There. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I won't say it was the same as the uh, Kennedy man on the moon by the end of the decade. Let's we won't put it at that level of uh, of prediction and impact. Um, but yeah, it's pretty cool that he was able to say that. Obviously, I think I think his uh, a real thing was he said seven years. So 2020, 2021, I think we get a pandemic pass um, for for a little bit of a delay on on that prediction. Um, but yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it's great that uh, Nobu put that uh, concept out there, uh, and then we all we have our our satellite on orbit, and now we're doing doing the testing. So uh, we've got a long way to go. Uh, we're not patting ourselves on the back or uh, taking any victory lap at all at this point. There is a long way to go. Um, it's a it's a big mountain to climb up to 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 build a company generally to do it in an industry that's so new and that no one's ever done before uh, and, and to, to, get, uh, to make progress toward making space sustainable, but we're taking the first steps. And that's, that's what we've gotta be, that's what, we're, that's what we're all proud of at the company, so. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's such an interesting point, right? Like we talked about a little bit earlier, is it a free for all? It's nobody's territory. It's no one country. Outer space is not controlled by any one country. No. So the whole concept of collaboration is so much more important in right. that way and self-regulation. But when you have governments, but also companies, um, how you know do you get people to act responsibly when they're only thinking about profits and stuff? It's amazing. It's really a challenge. And... Um... Governments are getting more interested in making sure that there is a responsible use of space. But the big challenge is you're right. It is a uh, different people have different words for it, but uh, orbital commons. It's a commons area. So um, it's a commons area to another level. So it's not like a commons area that's a that's a park uh, or something in in Japan, uh, which, of course, there is some jurisdiction over uh, that local um that local district uh, or state um, has has jurisdiction over it. So you can't just litter there. There's someone to clean it up. There's someone to enforce rules. Not necessarily the case. There isn't an orbital policeman that's going around and uh, pulling over satellites that aren't obeying orbital traffic rules. There aren't really any orbital traffic rules. <laughs> there's there's uh, this whole idea of there's something called space traffic management, which is being discussed about developing better orbital traffic rules. But right now, all we can talk about is best practices uh, and uh, kind of sharing information and best practices among different countries. Now, each country, to I mentioned the licenses, each country has a, a you have to get a license if you want to launch. Uh, if you want to launch anything in space, you need to have a license and you have to get a, a license from specific countries to have that satellite in orbit. And each country has different rules for, um, for how you're going to operate or what you're going to do with that satellite. And one of the things that is being strengthened now is, uh, is what you do at the end of life. What's your decommissioning plan? And so um, satellites need to start putting in place uh, rules for themselves that say, okay, this mission is going to last five years. We have enough fuel on orbit to last us, let's say, six years based on our current plan but we're reserving X amount of fuel so that when our, we're done with our nominal mission, we're gonna aim our satellite 
into the atmosphere and we're going to push it down so it can deorbit in a certain amount of time. Right now, the acceptable, uh, generally acceptable timeline of, um, uh, of uh, deorbit is uh, 25 years. So at the end of a mission, everybody, if you have a satellite in orbit, within 25 years of the end of your mission, you should have brought it back into the atmosphere or removed it in some way. At that, to quick side note, at that higher altitude, the geo altitude, it's too hard to bring it all the way back down. It's too far away. There's nobody that's going to have enough fuel to be able to push it all the way back down in the atmosphere. So there's something called the graveyard orbit, which is a little bit above that orbit. So it's kind of pushes out of the way a little bit. Nobody's using this orbit anyway. So put your trash up in this area for now. Now, that's a uh, that's not a long term solution, uh, and that's not a you know a, an ending solution because obviously it's still up there, but it gets it out of the way of this, this utilized orbit. So that 25 year rule is it. At the end of your mission, you've got 25 years to either bring it back down into the atmosphere to burn up or move it to that graveyard orbit if you're up higher in geo. And so companies are supposed to uh, abide by those rules. Now there's exceptions. Uh, it's not strictly enforced. And 25 years is still a long time. I mean, 25 years means that a, you know a satellite launched in, uh, let's say, 1990 had a five-year lifetime until 1995 and it's just hitting its 25 year rule now. So how many people are really enforcing that? It's a bit, it's a bit tough to, to enforce. There's, and it, it, things are getting better. Space traffic management uh, is, is getting more robust and, and there's more attention being paid to making sure that companies and countries um, follow those uh, expectations more closely, but it's still hard. And so for us, you know, we're an engineering technical company and so we're focused on the engineering side, but we have a strong policy team. We've got a team in Tokyo and Washington, D.C. and outside of London. And their whole goal is talk to policymakers, talk to international organizations. We're involved in all of these discussions to to make sure that people address these issues that you raised, J.J., about about policy. That's so interesting. And so important um, on one level, you might think of it like international waters and maybe above the country, there was a certain amount of space that you have to be responsible for. I mean, but what we've learned from coronavirus, of course, is that the environment knows no borders. When we have pandemic problems, it doesn't follow country borderlines. When we have problems in space with debris, it's not going to follow any kind of jurisdiction, right? So these are certainly problems that we have to solve on a collaborative, everybody working together type of system. And that's just, it seems kind of counter to human nature in, <laughs> in many ways, unfortunately, right? Unfortunately, unfortunately <laughs> it is. And, and the... The rivalries or competition spurs up on this. What we what we really do want to message is that it is in all of our interests. So, um, it's uh, you can even you can even message it almost as a selfish thing. Uh, you know, you you you're not just trying to protect someone else; you're protecting yourself. And if there's an accident in space. It's not just that adversary or that other company that's going to get impacted by this. Exactly like you said, JJ, it's like it's like the pandemic. And and there's actually um, there's a concept which maybe our listeners have heard before. Or you as well might have this thing called the Kessler syndrome. And the Kessler syndrome was posited by a NASA scientist as far back as the late 70s is when he was talking about this. At that time, there weren't that many objects in space, but he was very forward thinking, a guy named Donald Kessler. And he said that if we keep launching at the cadence that we're launching at, the areas that we're using are finite. Space, space itself is infinite. If we bring Elizabeth back to talk about planet hunting and talking about the vastness of space, sure, that goes for a long way. But the space that we utilize around our Earth is fairly finite. And so Donald Kessler, Dr. Kessler, said at the time, if we keep going to these same orbits, there is obviously going to be a time when they're, they, they get filled up. And, and, what, and what could happen as well is uh, when an accident happens, let's say two pieces of 
debris or two satellites collide in space, they create a certain number of additional pieces of debris. So let's just use a, a round number. They create and they create a hundred, probably a lot more than that. Let's say they create a hundred pieces of debris. And then those pieces of debris are all going around. Remember I said 28,000 kilometers an hour going around the earth. Now there's, instead of having two big pieces that are going around, now there's a hundred tiny pieces. Each one of those hundred tiny pieces has the capability to hit something else. And even a tiny piece as small as a centimeter can destroy a satellite, can knock off one of those you know, solar arrays, or they can put a hole in the satellite, which turns that satellite into debris. You, it becomes pandemic-like. It's uh, exponential in the growth. So those two become 100. Let's say just two of those 100 hit two more things that become another 50 or 100, then it's boop, 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 and it grows and grows. And, and, and what Dr. Kessler talked about, the Kessler syndrome, was we get to a point like that and the orbits become unusable. Uh, and then if the orbits, be, and, and it's much easier to clean up, to connect to large pieces of debris or to bring down a satellite or rocket body when it's bigger than it is to collect a thousand pieces of little tiny debris. We're working on the capability to collect those large pieces. Which, which we are seeing in the opposite problem in our oceans with microplastic. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? And, and, and Anthony uh, commented that was like the international waters concept. There's another analog, which is, which is what you just mentioned, JJ, which is uh, debris in the oceans. Uh, and, and how do we um, attack that problem? Uh, when it's a very similar concept. Uh, nobody owns it. Who's responsible? Who pays? It's similar. Yeah. And one of the solutions, one of the better ideas, is to have a reusable spacecraft, is it not? Or reusable or fixable satellites, which is one of the concepts of your team. Is that right? That's exactly right. And, and reusability... Um, Again, I think probably most of our listeners are, uh, are aware of what Elon Musk is doing is he's reusing those upper stages. And one of the big things he always talked about, he always talks about is uh, it, it, it's nonsensical to think we put all of this money into building this huge vehicle and then throw it away. And the, and the analog that gets used is you wouldn't fly in an airplane from Tokyo to New York and then just ditch the plane. Uh, you know, you use it again. And that's what they're doing. And, and Jeff Bezos' company, Blue Origin, is talking about doing that as well. Um, so there's a real focus on reusability. And then for what we look to try to do is, is fixing satellites in orbit and eventually, eventually getting to the point where we can recycle or reuse them as well. So rather than uh, bringing that debris back into the atmosphere to burn up, we, we envision a future where we can go up there and either fix or uh, melt down the what we have up there, that's a debris and, and reuse it again. Now that's, we're looking a bit farther into the future, but um, again, we're taking those first steps up the mountain. Because one of the things that uh, you hear from Tesla or companies making electric cars is that the rare minerals are so hard to find. Mm -hmm. And all of these satellites and uh, all spaceships are made from so many uh, valuable materials. It seems like we should be reusing what's junk up there, what we could reuse. Is that possible to resource some of these materials and reuse it? I'm sure it's a- Not yet. A difficult process. It's a difficult process. Not yet, yeah. not yet. Um, but we hope to, we hope to see it. And there's companies that are talking about it. Uh, there's a company right now in the US that's focused on um, 3D printing in space. Uh, so, that's a big one. There's a companies that are focused even on building like a foundry in space. So you could actually melt down. Now, again, that's, that's second order. That's next steps, but wow. we've got to, we've got to start looking at that. Um, so uh, I think it's, um, it's something that we, we want to focus on. Uh, and so uh, uh, we, we think it's going to be important for the future of the, um, of the ecosystem. That's awesome. Uh, thanks for the award. HAPS team. Appreciate that. <laughs> Um, one of the comments that you have on your video, you guys have a great 
a YouTube channel, explanation videos, a wonderful website, I should mention. Um, if people want more information, please check it out. I'll have the links below. Um, but talking about managing uh, lower space, uh, Leo, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, low earth orbit. Um, in the same way that we manage our highway systems, and I thought that was a really interesting concept. It's it's a it's it's a it, it can't be a perfect analogy, but yeah, it's exactly what we want to get in people's minds that that it is possible. And, and the way we manage the highways is we have um, monitoring. I mean, we have people understanding what's going on, where cars are, where traffic is. Uh, we, so we monitor what's going on and then, uh, we have, we have rules, of course, and, and then we have, uh, repair. We have ways to get things out of the way, uh, and we have ways to fix things if they're, if they're broken. And that's what we need in space. And the monitoring side is we talked about one of our business lines is in situ SSA, space situational awareness. Right now we're doing a lot of that monitoring from the ground. We've got a lot of companies that have uh, dishes that are looking up and saying, okay, where are all of the objects? And they can identify where they all are, but it's not a completely accurate uh, uh, capability to do so. So we need to improve that monitoring. We need to build in rules and that goes to that space traffic management um, concept that, uh, that we talked about earlier. Can we have rules that are based on what we're seeing, how we're monitoring? Uh, and then can we fix? Can we fix it? Can we repair? Can we remove? That kind of stuff. So exactly that graphic that you're showing of ours right now is orbital highway safety uh, on Earth can be connected to orbital highway safety in, uh, I'm sorry, highway safety on Earth can be the same as orbital highway safety in space. Yeah. And because uh, things are so collaborative, uh, you have to have a certain place to launch. You have people making parts of the spaceship or satellite in certain countries, mm. connecting to people in other countries who are doing the programming, connecting to other people in other countries, monitoring. Um, so hopefully because it's so international and be so collaborative, if you have people breaking the rules that everybody does set, that they would find it very difficult to do it on their own. Is that kind of the concept? Yes, very much. Uh, and so that's that comes back to, um, you know, countries and companies being competitors. There's going to be competition, but they better be working together too. Uh, because uh, if, if you try to go it alone, um, there's going to be consequences. And it's going to be, and not that there's going to be some higher authority that imposes consequences. That's still tough to do, but there's going to be consequences for all of us if uh, rules aren't uh, followed and, uh, and, and obeyed when, when things happen. So it, it's, it's better for, for all of us to do this. Uh, and that's something we really try to impart to companies and to the community. And, and we, you know, all of us, uh, JJ, you and I, and all of the people who are watching right now, <clears throat> it's incumbent on us to be aware of it and to talk about it and to talk about it to policymakers and to talk about it to friends and to talk about it to colleagues and say, well, this is an issue. We need to start paying attention. Um, we, we talked about the uh, equating this to the pandemic in some ways. I, I talk about it being equated in another, in another concept in that in uh, November of 2019, there were a few people talking about the possibility of a pandemic, but really it wasn't on any of our minds. None of us were really talking about it. I mean, if we asked any of us on this call right now, what are your biggest concerns for 2020? I would say that most of us would not say, you know, a global shutdown due to a pandemic, but it was always out there and there's always a few people talking about it. It's similar to this. And if, and if an accident happens that triggers a Kessler syndrome type of event where we have this exponential increase of debris, um, I don't want to be any of us to be saying, oh, wow, I wish we had thought of this earlier and taken some action on it. Uh, that's why we want to take action now. So, uh, you know, the whole, uh, you know, in, in English, uh, in US, US and UK, I think an uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure uh, comment. Let's, let's employ that ounce of prevention because the pound of cure is going to be expensive and tough to implement. So we want to fix it now. That's awesome. Uh, one other point I was really impressed to see is you have 35% female 
in your company. And, uh, you know, are there any other ways that your company is trying to walk the walk as well as talk the talk about sustainability? Uh, yeah, so on, on that aspect, on gender balance, it's, um, it's a challenge uh, because the aerospace industry is not known for its, uh, so its gender diversity. Um, but uh, we, do, we do try and, and it is hard, um, but that's something that, that we are focused on. Um, sustainability just in terms of um, of our company we uh, we haven't made a huge push on say reusability and certain um, things that we're, we're doing directly in all of our offices we are using uh, green propellant for um, for LCD our first mission so a more environmentally friendly propellant and that's something we really do want to focus on as well going forward so it's um it's always a, a difficult balance as we're trying to be a startup company uh, and do what we can to to uh, achieve what we want to achieve, but also hit these kind of sustainability markers. But it is something that's important to me, and it's important to all of us. Uh, you know, everybody who joined this company didn't do so um, out of money. Um, we think there's going to be a business. We're pretty confident that this is the start of what's going to be a, a very um, sustainable, in, in terms of a business sense, sustainable business going forward. We think that there is uh, money to be made in this business, but we didn't join it for that. I don't think most people join a startup, you know, with just that dreams of, you know, uh, making a whole bunch of money right away. People who joined this company joined because they have a passion for doing the right thing here. And they recognize that this is something that's important to do. It's essential for us and essential for our future generations. And it's fun and it's exciting. And so, okay, I get to, I get to solve a really challenging problem, whether that's a technical problem or a policy problem, as we talked about, or a communications problem or a business problem. There's a lot of problems to solve, but they're all interesting, challenging, fun problems to solve. Oh, and on top of all that, I get to do something that uh, is beneficial for the future and solves a problem that we know needs to be solved. So we really try, we really hope that that's something that we, we attract people who are interested in that and are passionate about that. And I think all of our team, all of our space sweepers, as you have the, uh, the logo up there and I have on my, on my t-shirt here, all of us uh, space sweepers are, are passionate about that. And so uh, to answer that, to, to, to give a long answer to your question, uh, so sustainability is important to us, orbital and and on on the ground, and uh, in terms of gender diversity, and in terms of thought and action. So we do want to um, continue focusing on that. That's great and so important. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. Uh, you hinted that there were some exciting things happening this year for Astroscale. Can you hint or give us a general view of things that are coming up for you guys? Well, there's always a lot of exciting things. So I could say that at any time over the last four years, and it would have been true. And I'm going to be able to say that at any time over the next few years, and it's going to be true. I mean, the biggest thing, obviously, that we're focused on is LCD. Uh, uh, doing our mission uh, in the next few months is, is a huge step for us. Uh, there was just a big release of a uh, cooperative agreement that we're working on out of our UK office. Uh, so you can, you can find that online about... Uh, uh, cooperation that we're doing uh, with the European Space Agency and our UK office. And so there's a, there's a big focus there. Um, so, uh, you know, those are probably two of our biggest things. But then, you know, we're building out our office in the US. We opened it uh, two years ago with, with one person. And there's now, what do we have, 25 or so people there looking to build out a mission there. Our UK office, we opened it uh, about four years ago. And there's now 50 people there. Um, you know, we're growing in so many different ways. Uh, so it's, it's a really uh, exciting time. And I see Space Gal's question in the U.S., our, our main office is in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and that's where the bulk of our team is located. And uh, we have also an office in D.C. where we have, I guess, five people now. And the D.C. office is focused on um, uh, uh, policy and communications sides. Not sure what blah means, space guy. <laughs> Is that good or bad? I don't know. Um, Astros oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's two people from Florida watching today. 
Florida is, of course, famous for space exploration yeah, and NASA. Yeah. Um, so if anybody needs to find out information about the great work that Astroscale is doing, have a look at www.astroscale.com. And you can see all of your links to social media and updated videos and information. Is that right? That's right. And we're active on all of those. So um so please do access. We have a we have a newsletter that goes out every month, and so you can subscribe and uh, and get updates uh, sent to your inbox on that. And then and then yeah, active on all uh, all social, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. That's wonderful. It must be one of those jobs, like you said, you love to do. So it must be hard to stop working. Uh, so I hope that you can also find balance and get out for some walks enjoy your life a little bit um it must be really hard because there's so much to do right there is but uh you know work life sustainability is a sustainable aspect of what we're focused on as well so uh it's it's hard for all of us on the team because there's so much to do and being uh being a, a startup there's limited you know resources are, are difficult financial and human so it's tough and everybody is dedicated to, to getting stuff done. So it's tough for all of us. But um, one thing I tell our team all the time is we need to maintain work-life balance. And uh, especially during these unique times, making sure we take time with family and friends and loved ones. So um, I'm, I'm continuing to do that. I hope you are as well, JJ. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important. You gotta, you gotta think of it as a marathon, not a sprint. That's right? it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. Yeah, um, if you just joined us, it looks like somebody just joined, please watch the replay. And if you comment, uh, write your comments or questions, we'll still try to respond, even if it's after for the replay. Uh, tomorrow, we're talking with a life coach, Catherine Groner, at 9 a.m. So please join us again then. Everybody have a great day. Take care. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.